All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. Her name is Eileen Ormsby. She's coming to us from Australia and Melbourne. And she had written a book that I came across on Amazon that I was fascinated by. The title was The Darkest Web. And I had done some research into the dark web doing kind of my investigative journalism pertaining to the smiley face killers. So I was really interested to read this book and it had some fascinating information. Uh, that book, The Darkest Web, was published March 14th, 2018. But Eileen is also a very prolific writer. She has written uh, six books, also has a blog titled All Things Vice. She's an attorney, freelance journalist, and uh, an author as well, obviously. Her book titles are such as Little Girls Lost, which came out this year, Murder on the Dark Web, also this year. She's been very busy this year. Stalkers 2020, Psycho.com, Serial Killers on the Internet. And her first book that I could tell from Amazon was titled Silk Road about Ross Ulbricht and black markets on the dark web. So uh, if you're on YouTube, you can ask her any questions if you have any uh, anything to add or anything. I could also bring that in the conversation. But for people who don't know your name or maybe not as familiar with your books, can you talk a little bit about yourself, Eileen, and how you came to write The Darkest Web? Uh, sure. Well, uh, as you said, I, I was a lawyer. I was a corporate lawyer working in London for probably the most conservative law firm in the history of the world. And I was working there when the uh, global financial crisis struck in 2008. And that sort of gave me this existential crisis of, um, you know, oh, my God, I'm working for the bad guys. There's people losing their houses. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm working for the people that are working for the banks and the, the money managers and that sort of thing. So I came back to Australia and, and decided to do something that I've always wanted to do, which was become an author. And so I quit my, my lawyering job, went and did a, a um, postgraduate course in professional writing and editing. And one of the classes in that course was a journalism class. And we had to pitch a story um, for, for that class to one of the big newspapers here in, in Melbourne. And I decided I'd, I'd pitch about this brand new site I'd just heard from, I'd, I'd heard from friends that had been using this site where they were literally hopping online, ordering drugs and having them delivered to their mail. And that, that site was Silk Road. So I pitched that to one of the major news agents, uh, news corporations here in Australia and they, they picked it up and ran with it. And as soon as I wrote that first story, the editor came back and said, oh, look, you know, tell us more about this dark web. Tell us about, you know, can you write more articles for us? So that was my beginning as a journalist. And I guess I just became the dark web specialist. And that's pretty much where I've stayed. That's That's been my specialty ever since. And that's led to the books and so forth. And all the true crime. Yeah, so the dark, pretty harrowing international tales of the dark web. But for people who may not be as familiar with the Silk Road story, can you talk about what Silk Road was and what they were doing and, and the mystery really kind of... Uh, enigmatic uh, central figure about Silk Road. Can you talk about that, please? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, Silk Road is, is why the dark web really sprang to people's consciousness, I guess, because so the dark web is just the colloquial name that we give to those websites that can only be accessed uh, via a dark net. And the most popular dark net is one called Tor, which is an open source piece of um, software that anyone can download. It's perfectly legal. It... Uh, allows you to surf the web completely anonymously or almost completely anonymously. Um, but what it also does is provide you with access to websites that you can't normally get to. So even if you know the direct URL to a website like Silk Road or, you know, it's, it's um, a current counterpart, if you type that into your Chrome or your Firefox browser, it'll just come back as, you know, site not found, does not exist, 404. Um, but once you download the Tor browser, which just looks like a normal browser, if you pop that same URL in there, all of a sudden you have access to it. And um, it's been around for a long time. It was developed by the US military and, and in, in conjunction with some others. And uh, it was developed to protect military secrets. But the whole thing about it was if only if the only communications going through through the Tor network were military communications, then anyone that is is conducting surveillance would know. Wow, that that packet is is um, 
military communications. So what they did was release it to the world, um, you know, out wide, open source, so that anyone can download it and use it. So it's, you know, they're, they're hiding amongst all the noise. Right. So uh, you asked me about Silk Road. Sorry. So Silk Road, what that did was it brought together three technologies. It brought together the Tor browser, so the dark web uh, aspect of it, Bitcoin, which was a very fledgling cryptocurrency at the time, and PGP encryption, which is a way of, of creating trust amongst people who uh, don't know each other's real identities. And the idea behind it was just to be an e-commerce so site like any other e-commerce site, so like eBay or Amazon or any of those big, big players, bringing together buyers and sellers of products. The only difference was instead of being buyers and sellers of, of books or DVDs or, or anything like that, it was buyers and sellers of drugs. It was the, um, you know, people who wanted to buy drugs, people who wanted to sell drugs. And it was Bitcoin that allowed this to actually happen. Of course, there's been trades going on online for many, many years before that. People were buying and selling over Craigslist and things like that. But the, the sticking point was always how to pay for it. You either had to meet the person in person um, or you had to arrange a bank transfer or something that could be traceable. Once Bitcoin came into the equation, that provided this brand new way of making these transactions where neither party needed to know who the other party was and the transaction could still be made. The other thing that, that Silk Road did, which was just like any you know normal e-commerce platform, was provide an escrow service. So when someone was buying drugs, rather than um, paying the seller of the drugs directly, they paid the site, Silk Road, which then held on to it in escrow until um, the buyer said, yes, I've got delivery of the drugs. They are what they said they were, release the funds. And then, of course, Silk Road would take its little commission and release the funds to the seller. The other thing that happened when they did that, when they released the funds, the buyer would also leave feedback. So, you know, five out of five, great stealth packaging, um, you know, uh, uh, tested it and it's, you know, 90% pure, all, all those sorts of things. And so like right. any other uh, business site, the sellers lived and died by that feedback and they would do anything to get the good feedback because that meant the repeat customers. Um, and right. on the other so side they... of it, of course, the sellers could um, rate the buyers. And if you were a buyer that had too many disputes or left bad feedback, then the really good sellers, the popular sellers, just wouldn't sell to you. Right. And there, there was kind of like be, before even Uber or some of these other kind of uh, uh, more modern places, these guys were, he was doing it first or the people through Silk Road were doing it first. So there was all this encryption and secrecy and there are all these fake names, but it be, it started off very small. I think at the time, uh, Bitcoin was like not even worth anything. Now it's what, 17,000 for one Bitcoin or something like that? Yeah, it was less, less, worth less than a dollar when they started. Right. So really just began. So can you talk about how the Silk Road started and how it evolved into this kind of international syndicate? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking I'm trying to think back and I'm, I'm thinking it's 2000 and end of 2010 that it started um, and it started to grow in 2011. What really pushed it forth? So it, it began just with uh, Albrecht himself. And of course, none of us knew his name was Albrecht. He was just admin. Um, selling mushrooms and he got onto some of the Bitcoin forums and said, look, you know, I've got this idea for this new site that Bitcoin might work for and it's a black market and, you know, what do you guys think? And, of course, all the, um, you know, the cryptographers are really interested in seeing uh, this was a, a, a proper use case for Bitcoin. Like philosophically, Bitcoin is a marvellous, amazing thing, uh, providing this sort of, you know, borderless digital currency that um, you know frees people up from from needing to go through the banks or or needing to have any state actors involved in their transactions between each other. It's a peer to peer transaction, and philosophically it's great. But no one was using it. No one knew what it, it was really good for. And this Silk Road was the first really good use case for it. So uh, you know the, the Bitcoiners were really interested and, and got on board and, and had a look at it, and you know, they were sort of saying, well, yes, this thing will work. These technologies converging together will actually work and you can safely make these transactions and um, so they began to sort of talk about it 
you know, these things always start in those little underground forums and then they, they grow further and further out, become more and more mainstream. Reddit's always one of the first ones to pick up on these, these obscure forums and start talking about them. And once it hits Reddit, it gets bigger and bigger. And that's pretty much what was happening with, with Silk Road. So it, it began very small and just grew, grew slowly at first until um, Gorka, which was, um, it's now defunct, but that was a, a massive gossip site at the time. On 1st of June 2011, they put out an, an article called um, The Underground Market Where You Can Buy Any Drug Imaginable. And after that, it just exploded. There was, you know, it, it went overnight from a couple of hundred people to thousands and thousands of people logging on and checking it out and realising that this is actually a viable alternative way of, of obtaining your drugs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the, the big things that they were pushing was this is a safer alternative. You know, everyone was against the war on drugs and this is an, for people who want to to buy drugs, this is the safe alternative. There is no chance of face-to-face -face violence. You, you you will not get a gun pulled on you. You will not get, you know, um, hit over the head and, and your drugs and money stolen from you. This is a safer way of doing it. And right. what's more, having all that feedback also created a much safer environment as well because if someone was selling bad drugs, if someone was selling, you know, um, uh, some sort of research chemical and calling it acid or MDMA, they'd be picked up very very quickly because there were forums on there where everyone was talking about the different vendors so uh you know in that way it was safer as well you at least you knew exactly what you were getting right and it was all shipped to your house and uh there were moderators it was a decent sized operation where there was moderators and things there was yeah so it became interesting but according to your book like he started off from nothing and then it was 1.3 million a week and there was some very serious transactions taking place tons of money well, that's right. When, when it started off, the idea was that it was going to be um, just for end users, so just for people that wanted to buy their personal use drugs uh, from someone on the internet. And they were able to, it also meant that they were able to buy their drugs from closer to the source than they normally would because, you know, your average Joe who doesn't really know a lot of criminals or is not in that world will go to a, a street dealer, will go to, you know, someone that's working in the clubs or a friend of a friend and they're right down the bottom of the chain. So by that time, you know, your drugs have probably been cut. They've gone through a lot of um, different handling. There's been a bit of money put on each time. Whereas this way they were able to go a lot, you know, the end user was supposed to go a lot closer to the source. Um, but what happened was, of course, once it started getting really popular and, um, you know, the, the amounts of money started being bandied around that, that was likely to be going through the site, obviously no one knew exactly, but people were starting to, to study the site and get an idea of, of how much was going through in transactions. Well, of course, you know, the um, organised crime followed and soon you were having much, much larger vendors there people that were selling in you know kilograms at a time which is obviously not for your personal use um but they, they stuck with this philosophy of um we will sell anything the purpose of which is uh is not to harm or defraud another person that was their big philosophy and um you know the people that the the members of the silk road were, were very much into that and that was one of the right. things that made it so strong and stable as well as they really really trusted this, you know, enigmatic leader of Silk Road who gave him, he, he gave himself the moniker in the end, the Dread Pirate Roberts, and everyone knew him as the Dread Pirate Roberts. And he was very involved in the site as well. He was very much a figurehead who, who gave a lot of speeches and, and spoke about a lot of these philosophies. And he really gathered a cult following of people who absolutely bought into the whole um you know, the whole philosophy, this was going to be the beginning of the end of the war on drugs. Right. And he had his libertarian ideals. He was a follower of Ludwig von Mises. So he had this kind of economic ideology. I mean, he was making money, but they definitely seem to uh, even Bitcoin itself. Right. So these kind of ideas were new, but these guys were right at the, the beginning. Uh, Ulbricht and he's probably one of the original Internet legends or one of the underground legends unknown at the time. But how did they decide on the name Dread Pirate Roberts? Or, and that was like uh, nicknames through the organization as well were from uh, Princess Bride, right? Yeah, it's from the Princess Bride. And the whole idea behind giving himself that name is that um, people would not know whether 
the Dread Pirate Roberts was the same person all the way through the lifetime of Silk Road or whether it was passed from one person to another, the way the, the name um, the Dread Pirate Roberts was passed on in the book or the movie of The Princess Bride. That was the idea behind the name. It was come up between um, Ross Ulbricht and his, um, his mentor, who uh, was only known at the time as uh, Variety Jones. He's now known to be Roger Thomas Clark, who was also facing a long time in prison. Um, he was Ross Ulbricht's mentor all the way through when the Silk Road was running. Nobody knew about Variety Jones. He was sort of in the background running things very quietly, whereas, um, you know, Ross Ulbricht, Dread Pirate Roberts, was very much out in front of people and very much a, um, you know, a visible part of the Silk Road. Right, and they had, they had another Inigo Montoya, so kind of these internal names that only Ross Ulbricht knew, but, you know, they, he had their identities, but nobody really knew each other and nobody knew what Ulbricht was up to. Can you talk a little bit about how it developed and how he became involved in kind of larger criminality other than uh, being a, a holder for drugs or a transactional agent for drugs? Yeah, well, I mean, I think he bought into his own legend quite a bit. He did get this cult following of, of people who were just so grateful to have this new opportunity to get clean drugs, um, you know, a regular supply of clean clean drugs. That he became this this cult leader, and they loved him. And um, I think he bought into that a fair bit. And um, but of course, once you know, once the money started rolling in, then the the um, organised crime followed. And so he started getting. You know, people contact him directly and saying, "Oh, can we do better? Uh, you know, better commissions on larger amounts being moved and that sort of thing." And uh, the 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 part <laughs> the part about this gets very very complex. But basically, what happened was he was approached by somebody who went by the name of Nob, saying, "You know, I need to move kilos kilos of cocaine and heroin. Can you move these for me?" And the Dread Pirate Robert said, yes, I'll, I'll set something up. And he set something up with one of his staff members who went by the name of Chronic Pain. And so the kilo was to be sent to Chronic Pain as a kilo of cocaine was sent, to be sent to Chronic Pain as a, a middleman. And um, what happened was, of course, he was being set up and that was undercover. Nob was undercover police. And so when the, the kilo was sent to Chronic Pain, um, police were there, ready to nab, jumped on and take over his his account. What right, the so police... The, right, so sorry. Please continue. But that's how the police kind of got into the whole, uh, into the Silk Road environment. That's sort of how they st the, they first got in, in inside when they took over the chronic pain account. But what happened was um, the police in this instance happened to be incredibly corrupt. So once they took over the chronic pain account... Um, what they secretly did was start moving Bitcoin. That So Chronic Pain had, as an administrator, had access to a lot of the wallets owned by different vendors. And um, what one of these corrupt police officers did, I, I, the two guys involved were uh, Karl Mark Force and Sean Bridges, Force and Bridges, and I can never remember which one did what. Um, but one of them, I think it was um, Bridges, started um, uh, shifting Bitcoin out of the vendor's accounts into uh, his own wallet secretly, not not with the um, permission of the law enforcement agency that he worked for. And when the Dread Pirate Robert saw all this money moving, he thought that chronic pain had stolen from him. And so he started discussing this situation with his mentor, Variety Jones, and they came to the conclusion that they needed to send someone around to... Uh, beat him up and get the money back. And then um, the person that they asked to do that was Nob. Nob, who was the undercover That's... police officer who'd right. gone to, to bust chronic pain. Uh, they thought he was a you know a big a big bad uh, organised crime figure, and he would be able to send some goons around. And so Nob agreed. And before you knew it, um, the the order had changed to murder him. They wanted to murder chronic pain, and um, Nob agreed to that as well. And so it came about that the uh, law enforcement uh, staged this murder of chronic pain. Um, Ross Ulbricht paid, I can't remember how much in Bitcoin, $80,000 worth in Bitcoin yeah, for this memory. murder. Yeah. Um, and, he, uh, um, and he demanded photographic proof, which they gave him of, um, of 
Curtis Curtis Green, who was the real name of chronic pain, uh, with a, a bunch of Campbell's chicken soup around his head that was supposed to look like he'd thrown up as he was being tortured to death. Um, so that murder never happened, but, you know, it, uh, it, it would really seem that uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts, Ross Ulbricht, believed it had happened. So that, that was the first one. And then he just got himself in deeper and deeper after that. And he had he had voluminous records, so he was keeping his his conversation logs too this whole time on his website, thinking that nobody would ever see those, right? Oh my god. It was like when he got caught, it was like everything you should never ever do. <laughs> it was it was absolutely insane. Um they they caught him with his laptop open. And his laptop basically had this diary that said, hey, today I decided to become a drug lord. Today I decided to put a hit out on somebody. This is how much money I made today. He just had this diary of exactly what he'd been doing. It seemed almost in too, too insane to be true. Like I, I honestly, when I first saw it, I was like, I don't believe that this is real. It's got to be it's got to be a mock up. But um, apparently it was all real. Uh, he was also logged into the back end of, of Silk Road, so um, into the mastermind control panel. Um, and it, his laptop was just this absolute treasure trove for law enforcement. He kept logs of all the chats that he'd had with his staff members, which is, you know, when you're working in the under, underworld on the dark web, that is probably the biggest no-no of all. Um, so he he broke every rule that he pretty much insisted that other people keep to you know he'd, he'd always tell people don't keep any chat logs um, use pgp encryption everybody on the dark web knows the basic thing that whenever you're uh, interacting with anyone else you use pgp encryption if you'd use that all the time then you know even if they had his key chances are it would have been way too laborious for them to go through and and get all the messages that they got and they got but he didn't use it um it was, yeah, it was just crazy. It's crazy. And it's interesting how they actually found out his identity. Do you recollect that? Because that's also, also an interesting story in itself. Well, it, it was a, a, a conflation of things. So um, the the basic way was a, he was an IRS agent. Um, it's always an IRS agent, isn't it? <laughs> he was an I, IRS agent that decided to start Googling a little bit. And I have to admit, I did the exact same thing. And I came up with almost the exact same result um, quite a while before. But he started Googling and um, the first mention of the Silk Road, the original Silk Road website, uh, which is obviously, it's a, you know, dark web websites, they tend to be a string of um, 16 random letters and numbers and with a dot onion at the end of it. So he started, you know, Googling for the first mention of that and came up with this guy, um, this uh, post in a, a forum, a psychonaut forum, um, by a guy called Altoid, um, sort of saying, hey, have you guys heard of this new site? It's, it seems like you can buy and sell drugs. Why don't you check it out? And then he, he gave this address. Um, and then so this IRS agent started going through and looking for, um, which is also something that I found that I, I was putting in my original book because I started writing Silk Road before Silk Road had been taken down. It was all oh, about when I wrote when I wrote Silk Road, it was being written in real time and it was about the rise of this new frontier of drug dealing and how it was going to change the world. And just as I was putting it to my publisher, Ross Ulbricht got caught and I had to very quickly change it to a rise and fall. Right, because um, you published it right in 2014. Sorry, he was arrested October 2nd. 2013. 2013. Sorry. That's right. And um, I, I just finished the first draft and was was putting it into my publisher when that happened. So I had to sort of quickly withdraw it and then tack on this end bit about him being caught. But that was long before it had ever gone to court. And so there's a lot of things that came out since then that you know I had no idea about until it all came out in court. Uh, but anyway, so this Eltoid, uh, who had been who had been you know looking like he was touting this brand new site back then um, had a lot of posts in a technical forum and on one of those posts that was asking for a uh, developer of some sort to contact him for a job and it had the email address ross albrecht at gmail.com and so the irs agent found this and that was um that that was one of the small 
pieces of the puzzle. But, uh, you know, even that was sort of, you know, put in this mountain of evidence because every three-letter agency in your country was working on this and several other countries as well. So, and they're all, you know, keeping secrets from each other and not working together that well, right. all that's, wanting to be the one that brought the down, is, right? <laughs> all wanting to be the one that brought down the Dread Pirate Roberts. So a lot of them weren't even listening to this IRS agent at first. Um, but yeah, that, that became the, the real smoking gun. But um, there was like a task force. So there was definitely a lot of people trying to figure them out. So you have this kind of anonymous guy and it was very important for them to get him while he was on his computer because they didn't want, they wanted to have it open so they could see everything. And that's, I, th I think they heard some rumor that he was at the library in San Francisco all the time. And that's that's really how it went down. Well, Pretty they didn't fun. hear a rumor. They, they, they had a tail on him by then. Oh, okay. So by that time they had figured out who he was. But like you say, it, they had to get the um, the laptop open. If, if he'd been able to close it, he had a kill switch on it, which would have just bricked it. And the best cryptographers most likely would not have been able to get into what was on that laptop. So they had to get it while it was open and they had to get it while he was logged in. Uh, so the way they made sure that he was logged in to the, the back end of the Silk Road um, site was by that time, there's so many different arms to this story, it's just insane. But by that time, um, another undercover, Homeland Security undercover agent had taken over another staff member's account. Um, a girl by the name of Scout had this account and her uh, she was just a sort of low-level level moderator and Homeland Security had, had managed to find her and take over her account and Dread Pirate Roberts did not know that. So um, Homeland Security was on staff at that time under the name Cirrus. So... Um, what, what Cirrus did, Homeland Security guy did, was um, message Ross and say, oh, could you have a look, or message Dread Pirate Roberts said, could you have a look at this um, inquiry for me? And this is while they all ha had him under surveillance in the uh, library at the time. And they, every other person in the library that day was actually an undercover FBI agent. So, um, you know, there was Ross and there was all these, under, you know, pretending to read books and do all this. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, so uh, Cirrus well, messaged him and said, could you have a look at this thing? And um, so they knew at that time that uh, Ross was going to be logged into the back end of Silk Road, and that's when um, they jumped on him. Jumped on him, in there. I mean, the computer. The, Ross Ulbrich is kind of an interesting story. Can you talk about him? And, uh, I mean, we talked a little bit, but who really was Ross Ulbrich? Yeah, and well, uh, Ross Ulbrich, um, think if you know the actor Robert Patterson, that's what he looks like, a very good-looking young man. Um, he, at the time, 29, I think, 29-year-old Texan fellow. He was an Eagle Scout. Um, he was a university student, a bit of a hippie, uh, but also, well, he, he was sort of a bit of a hippie in that, you know, he played the djembe drugs, uh, drums and, uh, you know, like mushrooms and, and weed. But um, he was also into uh, this very um, libertarian uh, free market philosophy of agorism uh, he also followed Landmark Forum a bit. He was, but he's very much an, an all-round nice guy that people really liked, and uh, you know, good, good, strong family, lots of friends. Um, until he became really obsessed with his the site, you know, that sort of took over his his whole life. And obviously, he couldn't tell his friends about it, and he had to spend every waking moment in his in his bedroom on the computer. Uh, but before that, you know, by all accounts, he was a, a fairly popular guy, certainly well loved by his family. Um, and yeah. He, yeah, nobody uh, knew. Like, successful. Uh, there were, right. There were only two other people you said that knew that you wrote about or that knew what he was really up to. So uh, pretty, very intelligent guy. When they arrested him, they took him to the MCC. So he was in New York right there with all these other, well, before all these other characters, Epstein, Maxwell, etc., but there was a, it was a large, broader operation to kind of wrap up uh, Silk Road, correct? I mean, it was much more international than just Ross Ulbrich. Well, yeah. Well, once they got him, um, that was the other thing. He had he had the identities of his staff members. So he, he hired staff in different er areas of the world. So there was always someone online. So he had people in all the different time zones. And his uh, top staff were Inigo in the United States, who was Andrew Jones, um, Libertas in Europe. He was um, an Irishman, uh, Gary Davis, and same, same, but different in Australia, uh, that was Peter Nash. And so 
he had all their identities. He was very, very paranoid and he insisted on having the, if people wanted to come to work for him, and believe me, a lot of people wanted to work for him. Um, he, you know, people were offering to work for free. He did pay them though. He, he paid them reasonably well, but not, not a huge amount for running a, a criminal empire, maybe a thousand bucks a week, all these people. Um, but he insisted that they had to send him uh, proof of who they were and he had different ways of, of making sure that they weren't lying to him about it so he had all their identities on his computer and so they um, about a, a month later they all got um, swooped on as well and arrested so uh, yeah people all around the world and the last one to get arrested pretty much was Variety Jones who was living in Thailand at the time right he was and you, a few years later right and you had kind of uh, I mean as a journalist you and him uh, kind of well you went to thailand to meet him correct yes i did um so i i knew him and if you could see me i'm doing air quotes at the moment uh in an online matter first so i was uh, talking to him uh, via email and um this website my planet gunja that he was involved in and uh so i knew of him quite well and i was trying trying to get him to uh, agree to let me come and see him um come visit him in, in thailand and th this is when he was still free and he was taunting police at the time. Then when he got arrested, um, I went and visited him in Bangkok Remand Prison. So I saw him about five times uh, while he was there in Bangkok Remand. And he was kind of a mysterious figure too. I mean, there was a reason he hooked up with Ulbricht. He was also uh, part of kind of underground drug dealing, right? Yeah, he's a real, I mean, so he's probably uh, close to 60 and he's a real old hand in what they call the seed biz, and he's always been involved in very much online uh, drug trade and a very strange character. He's um, been involved in a lot of um, different uh, disputes and uh, spats over the years, and uh, he's a larger-than-life character for sure, which is exactly what Ross Ulbricht said when he first came on the scene. Um, uh, I've met this guy, Variety Jones. He's become a mentor to me, but he's a larger-than-life character. Uh, and that's exactly what he was. And when I met him, um, you know, you could see all the time his mind was going a million miles an hour. And um, every, every day when I came in, um, uh, you know, there, there'd be something that I'd said the day before and he'd obviously been mulling over it and thinking over it because then he'd pick up on that thing and ask me, you know, to draw things out on that. He's a really interesting character. Um, he's he was fighting extradition for a couple of years from Thailand, but he is now in New York and due to be sentenced next week. Interesting. Yeah, I just saw that something happened. I, mean, I think he was finally convicted just this year before the pandemic started. Yeah, well, he, he pleaded, pleaded guilty, so there was no court case. Um, and I think he's pleaded down to a um, to a charge that will get him a maximum of 20 years in prison, and he's hoping for 10 and I think the prosecution's asked for 15 or 20. Fascinating. And then the two corrupt cops, they also got prosecuted, correct, and are in jail or spent three or four years in jail? Uh, yes, they both got uh, prosecuted. They got sent to prison. Um, and their corruption was insane. Like, it was the two of them were doing these. One of them was um, uh, basically, um, so before Ross Ulbricht got caught, one of them was uh, contacting him and providing him with information in return for Bitcoin and also contacting him under another name and threatening him <laughs> um, in return for Bitcoin. So he was uh, extorting him and um, uh, bribing him, bribing and blackmailing, basically. Um, so that was um, Karmark Force, I believe. Whereas Bridges, who knew all about uh, computers, he was the one that was actually stealing all the Bitcoin from using you know, Curtis Green's account and stealing Bitcoin from uh, Silk Road vendors, which uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts then uh, he replaced quietly and personally without telling them that it had been stolen in the first place. Uh, so they both got caught, but both got sent to prison for something like seven years. But mysteriously, um, one of them is out now, uh, very quietly released. And that may or may not have to do with very recent news about a um, Silk Road wallet containing over $1 billion worth of Bitcoin uh, has just been passed over to the Department of Justice over there uh, from someone who claimed to have hacked it from B Silk Road back in 2011. So the wallet the wallet can be traced back to Silk Road. It is one of Silk Road's wallets. That's um, incredible. 
Yeah, and That's it's amazing. I mean it's it's this burgeoning new story. Silk right. Road is a story that keeps on giving. <laughs> it's this burgeoning new story of like where the hell did this wallet come from? Like people knew that it existed and that it, it um, uh, was connected to Silk Road, but it hadn't moved for, for years. No one knew right. really, you know, whether it was just lying dormant, whether, um, you know, maybe Ross Ulbricht still had access to it and it was just, you know, sitting there quietly while he was in prison. But all of a sudden it moved, the whole $1 billion moved, and then uh, we found out that it had moved to the US government and apparently it was by some hacker. Um, so, and at the same time, Bridges has been released from prison very quietly. So we're wondering if it was, in fact, something to do with Bridges that, um, and he was held onto that $1 billion and sort of gave it to him in return That's for Like who release. would have known at that time that, that Bitcoin would be worth what it is today? And I think the I think you wrote in the book, didn't you say Ross Ulbrich could potentially have been worth $90 million or something like that? Oh, he'd be worth way more. Done? Way okay. more. Um, in fact, there, there's one good story. Like, there's one guy that um, was a, a vendor on Silk Road, and he, he was uh, he was a real nice hippie hippie dude. Uh, didn't do anything hard, hard drugs. Um, mostly sold paraphernalia and and weed. And he got caught and went to prison. And he went, when he went to prison, Bitcoin was worth hardly anything. Eighteen months later, he came out and he was a millionaire. So <laughs> that kind of prison wasn't too bad for him. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's a lot that happened after Silk Road, Silk Road. I mean, I saw that you wrote about Mt. Gox, which is also involved in Bitcoin fraud. There's a lot of, I mean, the book's amazing because there's just, because of the anonymity, there's all kinds of scams. But there were also Silk Road 2.0, but also these other people who followed up after Ulbricht got arrested. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, um, you know, as soon as Albrecht got arrested and there, it was all over the news and what they were saying was $1.2 billion of um, uh, turnover in Silk Road in two years, well, that's that's good numbers for any startup, right? You know, and people's ears pricked up and go, wow, that's, uh, that's a lot of money that can be made in two years. And a whole bunch of other people were very, very quick to step into the void left by, by Silk Road. And um, uh, so within... Uh, a month, Silk Road 2.0 had started with some of the uh, staff members from the old Silk Road who hadn't yet been um, caught and incarcerated, and other markets also sprang up. So all of a sudden, it was floodgates were open because while Silk Road was running, here's another thing about Dread Pirate Roberts' cult status and Silk Road's cult status. A few other markets tried to start up. So, you know, competition's good and all that sort of thing. And people just were not having it. They were like, no, we want Silk Road. We want the Dread Pirate Roberts. Any of you others can, can nick off. We're not interested in you. Um, but once Silk Road went down, there was a room for all these new markets to open up. And to this day, there's the markets that are open nowadays dwarf the size that Silk Road ever got to. So, you know, you, you often think of Silk Road as being the biggest, but it's it was the biggest at this time but there's been many others since then that have been much bigger. Some of them have been taken down by law enforcement. Some of them um, exit scam. So that's a very common thing. Believe it or not, some of these new markets are run by crooks. And what they do is they wait until there's, you know, um, 10, 20, 30 million dollars of, of money sitting in the escrow accounts and then they just shut up shop and nick off with all that Bitcoin. Um, so that's happened quite a few times and others are still running to this day. And they're right. always, you know, improving on their um, security. And uh, it's actually the most secure ones are a lot harder to use now than Silk Road was just because they insist that you need to learn cryptography and, and a whole lot of other things and, and use Monero instead of Bitcoin and that sort of thing um, to, to stay safe. Fascinating. Yeah, you mentioned the Evolution Marketplace is one of the exit scams where they raised all the money and then disappeared. Nobody ever found them. There was millions and millions of dollars. No, recently. Verto and Kimball are still out there somewhere. There was, oh, there was like Reddit went insane when this happened because, um, you know, everyone loved Evolution. It was such a, it was so well run. It was probably the most stable and um, best unit user interface of any of the markets ever. And then when um, Verto and Kimball, they basically told everybody, yeah, we've got enough money, see ya, and just shut up shop, nicked off with loads and loads of money. Uh, not sure how many millions, but a lot. Um, and, yeah, they, as far as we know, they've never been found. They might be running another market. We don't know. It's incredible. It's amazing. Can you talk a little bit about Alpha Bay as well, what happened with that story? Uh, Alpha Bay, yeah, that was another really large market. Um, and 
that was that was running for a couple of years or a year and a half or something um, before law enforcement took that one down. Uh, they they bust in on a guy by the name of Alexander Kazes, who was living in Thailand at the time. He was um, one of the main administrators of Alpha Bay, um, and then he mysteriously committed suicide. And again, I'm doing air quotes in the air um, in a Thai prison cell before um, you know they could ask him anything really. But uh, yeah, that one was taken down by law enforcement. But he he also had tons of money, had a very flashy lifestyle. But it was interesting because some of these uh, notorious characters popped up in that case. He was arrested July. 2017, Rod Rosenstein and uh, Andrew McCabe were talking about that, but they said that Alpha Bay was 10 times the size of Silk Road, so a huge operation, too. It was a huge operation. You know, those, those sort of numbers get bandied around all the time, but no one really knows um, how much money is going through. All we do know is it's a lot more than we ever suspected. Um, you know, back in the, the early days of Silk Road, I genuinely believed that it was actually quite a, even though I knew it had a lot of users and that, I, I sort of thought it was a relatively modest um, operation. But now, you know, you realise just, and they're growing all the time. So every year the Global Drug Survey comes out and every year there's more and more people are buying their drugs online instead of, you know, the traditional from a friend of a friend or through those sorts of networks. Wow, fascinating. Do you know, what do you think that kind of dark web, the size of the dark web market. Do you have any idea how big that is in billions or? Of the current the, of markets? The current, yeah, the current drug market on the dark web. Uh, well, there's there's um, there's about a dozen different drug markets running at the moment. moment. There's probably two major players. Um, I have no idea what's going through. They, they're getting more and more secretive and better and better at hiding their turnover. But I can guarantee it's a lot. I mean, they've, sure. they've got hundreds of thousands of, of active users all the time. Remarkable. I mean, it's just a fascinating uh, story, that whole that whole Silk Road. But, I mean, there are other parts of your book. The way you broke up this book was dark, darker, darkest. Where darkest is pretty grim. Uh, maybe not get in too much detail about that. But can you talk about uh, your research into this interesting online group, Bessa Mafia? <laughs> that was probably my favourite interaction on the dark web in general, I guess. Um what, something that always comes up is that you can buy on the dark web is hitman services. They're a real staple of the dark web. And, um, you know, in, in the book, I, you would say I, I go through trying to hire one of the early ones to kill a fictional ex-husband. Um, and uh, they're all scams, you know. They don't make sense. It, the, the whole thing about commerce on the, the dark web is it needs to be something that is easily transferable and something that is a repeat custom. So drugs are a perfect thing because, you know, personal amounts of drugs, they just go in a regular business envelope, indistinguishable from any of the millions of others, easy to mail. And um, the customers are repeat customers. You know, people don't buy one drug once. They, they come back over and over and over again. Murder for hire, not so much. It's a personal service where you have to, you know, go and meet someone and kill them. Um, and most people generally probably only want one person bumped off in their lifetime. So once you've actually paid Bitcoin to have a murder carried out, what possible reason does the person who's received the Bitcoin have to actually kill anybody? They have your money. They don't have any, there's, there's no incentive whatsoever for them to go and kill someone. So all the murder for hire um, sites were always scams. And I used to laugh about them, write about them. And um but that that was the case until one day, um, you know, I, I was working with this um, uh, security researcher in the UK called Chris Montero, and uh, he also he ran the deep web Reddit subreddit, and he was also a big one for um, they're all scams, they're all scams, and until this new one sort of burst onto the scene, and instead of a really crappy website, it had a really slick um, website, great user interface. Um, you know, you could log on and, and, again, you'd be matched up with a killer in your area. So it wasn't, you know, just one person saying, I'm, I'm offering murder for hire. Um, it was a, a site that was, again, offering escrow and it'd match, you, it'd match a, a person that wanted someone killed with a killer in their area, put them together, and um, once the murder was carried out, they'd release the, the funds from escrow. Um, and they had an army of people posting all over Reddit, posting all over the clear web about, 
this one, this this is the first genuine dark web murder for hire site. It is the real thing. It had testimonials and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, Chris and I were both still saying, no, nah, it's still a scam. It might be a slick scam, but it's still an absolute scam. Next thing you know, Chris has received this email message and it's a, a video and it's a video of someone holding up a piece of sign saying, this is a message from Beeson Mafia to Pirate London, which was his website. Um, watch this. And then it was a, a guy torched a car, uh, torched a car in his honour, which freaked Chris out a bit. Um, but a few days later, in a magical way that hackers do things, we suddenly had, Chris suddenly had access to the back door of Visa Mafia, which he provided to me as well. And what we found when we went into there was um, exactly what we thought. It was a big, big fat scam. We had a treasure trove. It, we had absolutely every email that was sent and received by Visa Mafia. We had all the orders. We had the um, photographs of people that had had hits taken out on them, all those sorts of things. And it was all available to us. And what we saw was it was run by one single guy by the name of Yura. And he was he scammed in a way that would make a Nigerian prince proud. And like every every time some, someone would pay for a murder and then he'd say, oh, like the, the hitman was on his way, but then something happened and we need more money, more money. And he'd just fleece these people for more and more money and never killed anybody. And, and people would just keep on giving him more money until they realised that they'd been scammed and give up. And... Um, and so, you know, that was an interesting and thing. They to were find in out. Sub substantial amounts of money, too. So, like thousands, 10,000 here, 20,000 there, a lot. Yeah, he'd, he'd charge them whatever he could get out of them. So, you know, if he could fleece someone of $1,000, he would, but it went right up to $40,000, I think someone paid for a hit. So, he'd, he'd just, you know, get what he could out of them. And he, you know, he was very prolific. He was he was the ultimate work from home dude. He was on the, on the email nonstop, you know, um, getting the, uh, pulling these people along. So it was good to find out that it was definitely a scam and he didn't want to hurt anybody. But the thing was, was all of a sudden we had, and and we shouldn't have had the, these things because hacking is still illegal, but we had these lists of um, photographs and names and addresses and details of people who had hits taken out on them. And the people that took the hits out really meant to kill them. They paid thousands and thousands of dollars. Right. And this was a thing, you know, well, what do we do? Obviously, we've got to tell law enforcement. Well, you try telling the FBI or uh, NCA or the AFP here in Australia, oh, there's this dark web hitman site and he's not really carrying out hits, but there's people that really want hits and here's the, they just don't want to hear from you. They, they think you're completely crazy. They have no interest whatsoever in, in um, listening to you. And Chris especially, he's, he's a little bit manic and he was trying. He was really trying. He was all over the FBI all the time saying, look, this is happening, this is happening, you've got to take notice of this. And they didn't take much notice until one of the people, like, and at the same time I was writing up on, on all things Vice about it, um, and on um, uh, one, one of the people that I've written about um, who was still very much alive at the time, Amy Allwine. Um, you know, I, I sort of mentioned her in one of my blogs. Well, she suddenly wound up dead. And that's when the FBI really uh, started to sit up and take notice. And, oh, these people, even though the hitman is not real, these people really want to kill somebody. And it, it really um, is an important thing. Uh, you know, we, right. we need to start getting, getting in touch with these, um, these other targets. They had actually gotten in touch with Amy. So they had said, oh, look, you know, do you know anyone that might have wanted you dead? There's your name's on this dark website. Someone's paid $13,000 to kill you. And she was like this Minnesota housewife, um, mother, um, you know, church deaconess. And she said, oh, I've got no idea. And they oh, well, keep an eye out, won't you? And that was pretty much it. They, you know, there was, there was no real in-depth um, uh, investigation into who might have wanted to kill her. Um, guess who it was? Well, it was her husband. It's always the husband, isn't it? It was her husband. And, um, you know, once he realised that he'd been scammed out of all his money, he shot her himself. Um, but then, yeah, so after that, law enforcement started taking it much more seriously and there were um, arrests all over the world of all these people that had put out hits on Visa Mafia. But at the same time, then Yura started writing to me and he, he, he started writing to me and at first he was, um, you know, 
threatening me and saying, I, I have hit men in Australia and I know who you are, you don't know who I am and I'm going to come and kill you and all that. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm in your back door, dude. I, I, I know that you don't want to hurt anybody and I know you don't have any hit men. So I wasn't that worried, even though there was these pretty nasty threats coming through. And then he changed his tone and he said, oh, look, I'm actually doing a good thing. I'm doing the world a favour. These are people that would uh, um, would be murderers. And if I'm not taking their money, they're going to go and spend money on a real hit man and real people are going to get killed. So stop writing about me and come and work for, work for me. He wanted me to come and um, start writing up his, his website because English was his second language. And he said, oh, with your good journalist skills, you could come and write much better um, language for me and we could make much more money. And then he offered to let me take on some of the people and, and um, try to, you know, do the emailing and try to get the money out of them. Um, and it was, I've got to say, it was very tempting as a journalist uh, to do that job, but it was also, um, yeah, probably not not quite ethically right. So I couldn't take him up on, on the offer. Did they um, ever find out who he was? He was from Bulgaria or something, right? Well, we thought he was somewhere in Eastern Europe. And I was actually um, hired by CBS as a consultant on their 48 Hours program. They did an uh, investigation into it. And when I was hired onto that, I contacted you and I said, oh, look, you know, will you, you come and meet me? They promised to disguise you, all that sort of thing. And he said, yeah, we'll meet in London. Um, and he, he got quite excited because he thought, oh, they're going to say that I'm a real, I've, I've got a real hitman site and they're going to advertise for me. And he actually provided the producer with two names and um, details of hits that had been taken out. And, you know, 48 hours is like, Oh, I don't want this, you know, what, what, uh, what, what do we do? And they passed it on to um, uh, law enforcement, believing it to probably be fake. 100% true. Two, two arrests were very, very quickly made. Wow. Made the news everywhere of, you know, 48 hours thwarts murder for hire. Um, uh, but then Eura got really upset that it said that he had a fake website and um, he, he felt like he'd been betrayed and then he wouldn't come and meet me in London after all. So that all fizzled out a bit. But, yeah, he's still out there somewhere. Somewhere, still out there somewhere, but he kind of uh, had a little bit of animus towards you and Chris because that led to an unpleasant uh, event for, was it Chris Montero? Oh, yeah. So, um, one of, when, so Euro went back hot and cold on us, basically, especially he, he's always hated Chris. Chris has always hated him. Um, but uh, with me, he sort of went hot and cold. But one of the things that he did was uh, he started putting out um, these – posts really badly written laughable sort of news articles saying um the real owner of visa mafia is chris montero and eileen olmsby they're they're you know the real and then you'd write these convoluted articles about how we're the owners of this site visa mafia and it was pretty clearly not genuine news so i, I thought it was a bit of a joke and uh, next thing you know, the National Crime Authority is, is banging down Chris's door. They, uh, um, in He lives in London. They bang down his door, arrest him for being the owner of Visa Mafia. They take him in and question him for like, I think they held him for like two or three days um, where he's just trying to explain, no, 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 I'm a security researcher. I, I write about it. I'm, I'm not them. And, um, yeah, they held him for a couple of days before they realised uh, the error of their ways and released him. Right. So it's just this web of international intrigue, a lot of uh, cloak and dagger stuff for you. Um, there's so much more in this book. We're at about 53 minutes. Do you mind taking a few questions from the listeners? No, that's fine. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Eileen? And you've also written, I mean, there's much more to this book. It gets pretty grim. The darkest part is about Red Room, Snufflix, uh, some names probably you might know chloe ealing uh and a lot of kind of pedophilia stuff too so it gets it's uh there's a lot of interesting extra stuff anybody else have any questions or anything um and your other books you also wrote about these these books this year can you talk just briefly about that promote those oh yeah so this year uh the reason i've been so prolific is um for my day-to-day -day money i i write um scripts for the case file true crime podcast um, and so what I've been doing this year under COVID is uh, getting together the scripts that I've written for that, that podcast and putting them together into to books. So they're just more general true crime. A lot of them have an internet aspect to them. That's sort of my, my thing, um, but not necessarily all of them. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've released uh, – well, they're not exactly the same as the scripts. They're sort of 
extended versions of the case file scripts all put together and uh, into books. Can you say that podcast again? I just missed it. Oh, uh, the case file true case, crime. Yeah, case, case file, file true crime podcast. I'll have to yeah. look that up. Um, let's see. Lee Veltman is asking, "What do you have any thoughts on the Australian Royal Commission stuff?" I don't know what that is. Uh, any familiar? particular Royal Commission? There's a lot of them. Okay, well, Lee, you'll have to follow up with a question. Oswald Spengler, did Eileen's research have any many connections to the Aaron Schwartz case? No, Aaron Aaron Schwartz was um, he, he was probably more um, pre what I um, oh, it's a tragic tragic thing. Um, no, he, not really involved because I was mostly involved at, at, at around that time. I was involved in the drugs markets. Um, rather than, than what Aaron was doing, which was, uh, you know, releasing um, right. Right. academic papers and that sort of thing. Gotcha. Here's another one. Seems like when they got rid of the Silk Road, it opened up for a much nastier kind of dark web. Would you agree with that? Well, the markets that came after Silk Road were run by crooks. So Silk Road was run by, and you could say it was run by a crook, but Ross Albright really was... Um, uh, he was a bit of a, a visionary and a dreamer and a philosopher and all those sorts of things. And, you know, that, that major philosophy of Silk Road was it would, wouldn't sell anything, the purpose of which was to harm or defraud another person. So when these new markets opened up, they didn't have any of that going on. They would sell anything. So now you can buy, um, you know, um, stolen personal information, stolen um, financial information. You, they're, they're much more free-for-all. And they're, they're they're just run by business people. They're they're not run by people that want to have these fuzzy, warm forums of lots of good discussions. Um, Ross Ulbricht he hired a doctor. There was a doctor on the staff, a real man, Fernando Cordovia. He's a um, physician in in Spain. His specialty is drugs, and he was on staff to provide free advice to the customers of Silk Road about their drug drug intake. And um, it was a very very popular thing that he did. So, you know, that, that sort of thing doesn't go on much anymore. Gotcha. There's no uh, book clubs. There's no robust, robust discussion forums or anything like that. It's just pure commerce. Gotcha. Another question from Pete Adler. Is Ross Ulbricht's family still trying to get him a new trial? Well, right now they're trying to get him a presidential pardon, which is uh, that's all, all he can uh, hope for now. He's, he's exhausted all of his appeals. Um, so his, his real only hope now is a presidential pardon. So Ross Ulbricht received two life sentences um, without any possibility of parole. He, is, he's, he was 29 at the time. He's going to die in prison, which is very, very severe for what he did, I think. Um, you know. Yeah, two life sentences is incredible. Yeah, it, it's, it's manifestly excessive for his crime. It doesn't seem proportional at all, in my opinion. No. Um, is there anything I'd miss? Anything you'd like to add? Or social media, or contacts, or your um, blog, all things Vice. What uh, can you? If anybody wants to reach out and ask you any questions, uh, probably the best place is Twitter, which I think is where you found me, um, which is just at Eileen Ormsby. Uh, that's where I'm most prolific. I I do have a blog, but I'm very very bad at updating it. I'll, I'll occasionally put something up there. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say go go for Twitter. I mean, I, I tried Instagram as well. I just don't get it. I don't either. Uh, so have you, <laughs> Twitter's have you, the place. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm too old to use Instagram. So again, great interview, just fantastic information and knowledge and just supremely well-spoken. Love the book too. It's really just something that uh, I was riveted to read. I just really enjoyed reading it. So thank you so much, Eileen. Again, the book is The Darkest Web by Eileen Ormsby, O-R-M-S-B-Y. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, William. All right, take care.